Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. I cannot wait for this conversation. We've been so excited to, to host you. Um, and thank you for Claire for organizing. I want to share that in a week and a half, we're going to have another We at Yale Innovator Series event with Spanada Palapu. Um, I'm going to share the information in the chat, but she's the um, founder of ZoEasy. It's a platform which educates, educates and matches migrant workers to the right employment opportunities using ethical and transparent hiring processes. So it's going to be fascinating and inspiring. Um, I hope you tune in. I'm going to share the information in the chat and now I want to pass it to Claire. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, yeah, hi. I'm going to do a quick introduction of our group and then I will introduce you. So, okay, great. Hi, everybody. So great to have you here today. My name is Claire Kalikman and I'm a member of the Yale College class of 2021 and the communications coordinator for We at Yale. I'm going to tell you a little bit about We at Yale before we get started. We at Yale is the Women Entrepreneurs and Innovators at Yale, and we are a cross-campus initiative co-founded by leaders at the Program for Entrepreneurship and the Sci Center for Innovative Thinking at Yale. We at Yale was launched in 2017 with the mission to empower student leaders, innovators, and entrepreneurs at Yale to launch and lead their own ventures. Whether these students launch their companies today or tomorrow or in five years, we strive to equip our community with the essential skills and efficacy to do so, through skill-based workshops, networking events, and our T-series. So with that, I'm super excited to have Rebecca Minkoff who embodies many of these principles. And I will give you a little introduction, although I'm pretty sure anybody joining us here today knows exactly who you are. So Rebecca Minkoff is the founder of the eponymous brand, creator of the Female Founder Collective, host of the Superwomen podcast, and now author with the launch of your book, Fearless. So thank you so much for joining us here today. Thanks for having me and happy. I don't know if you guys are on spring break, but if you are, um, thanks for tuning in. Absolutely. So we have lots of questions for you today about your career path to becoming, you know, the female on, innovator and entrepreneur that you are today. And I'd love to start at the very beginning. Um, you rose to prominence when you created a shirt, an I Love New York shirt that your friend Jen Elfman wore on TV and it became super famous. And I'm wondering, you know, what that experience was like for you, kind of overnight success, but not having a business in place to launch it and how you decided to go all in on your brand. Yeah. So I think when you hear the word overnight success, it, it sounds much better than in reality it actually is because um, all that meant was people knew my name. You know, I had orders. I had, you know, lots of inbound requests for that shirt, but no money to buy the materials, you know, couldn't pay my rent. Uh, was avoiding my roommate who was like, when are you going to pay me? Um, but it was it was the spark that I knew that if I just held on to that, I could ignite something. Um, and so very quickly had to figure out, like, where do I get these shirts? How do I mass produce them? Uh, and, and really just really knowing that I had a, a five piece clothing collection, um, how do I just sort of go with the momentum that that shirt had. So yes, I had other things and I wanted other people to buy those things, but I was like, let me hitch my wagon to this star and really hope that if I continue to do that and people can see that there's more to this brand this, than this t-shirt, um, they'll take a meeting. So it got my foot in the door, but I always tell people like, just because now your foot's in the door doesn't mean it's going to be easier to open. You know, you still might have to pry it open. You still might have to kick it open. And I very quickly had to learn some basic business 101. Um, I can tell you as a businesswoman now, 20 years later, uh, the decisions I made at the time, you know, I wouldn't necessarily have made business wise, but um, I just at that time was sailing on my gut. Mm, definitely. So you made a pretty big decision early on, which was to go into business with your brother. Can you tell us a little bit about why you decided to do that and how that dynamic has worked? Yes. So from the year 2001, when I launched the t-shirt till uh, early 2005, I was on my own. I had a very small, at, at its biggest, I would say the business was doing about $250,000 a year in revenue, zero profit. In fact, I was going into debt because I was not my skill set, as I have shared earlier, uh, costing, um, you know, so I was able to supplement, you know, the losses on the side with some styling jobs. And when I did the bag, I felt that similar igniting of a spark. You know, the bag resonated with women in a way that, it hadn't. Uh, we had found a white space. This was pre the days where uh, it was just a $20 bag at Target or luxury. 
Um, and so to come out with a bag at $5.95 was an incredible deal. It was made in the US and there was a whole little crop of us that came up in that time period. And so I remember calling my dad and saying, finally, this bag that I'm making, it's selling out and people are reordering and I can't keep it in stock. Will you, will you loan me some real money? And he was tired of that, that question that I had been asking him a lot. And he's like, no, but call your brother. Maybe he'll help you out. So I just remember we had a really uh, basic phone call. Do you have a business bank account? Why would I have that? I don't even have enough money in one to split it into two. Do you have a tax ID? Like the basic things that now obviously every business has when they start. And I didn't have any of those. It was literally like, you know, running with the wheels flying off. Uh, so he really at first put in basic business, you know, uh, foundation. And when he could see that this was something that like, I kept coming back to him be like, okay, I paid you back. Give me more, I paid you back. He was like, what is going on? And so when he started doing his own investigations into the potential, but the market was, that's when he got serious. So he decided to close the software company and, uh, you know, really work on this full time with me. So in the beginning, we had this, you know, great dynamic of we were both in our own lanes, fully owning our own areas. And then as he started to learn more about mine and I learned more about his, sparks flew. There was definitely a lot of fighting that ensued. And, you know, over the years, you know, we talk about it very openly. We, had, we hired a business counselor to truly help us figure out where we can leverage each other's strengths. But it's like any partnership, you know, you're going to spend more time with this person than you will your partner. And so... How do you sort of set those foundations of this is how I want to be treated. This is what I need and want from you so that there's no surprise when, when stuff gets hard because it's going to get hard and it's going to get hard a lot. And so you want to know that at the end of the day, whoever you're working closely with, you you know what, how to treat each other. Hmm. I think it's really refreshing to hear you say that and to hear that, you know, maybe you didn't have an, a complete five-year plan or 10-year plan and know exactly what you were doing from the beginning. Um, I'm wondering, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say just, just to further that I remember when I went to a bank to get a loan and they're like, do you have a five, you have a business plan? And I was like, excuse me, what, what's a business plan? <laughs> just loan me the money. I swear I'm good for it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, it's also interesting to hear you talk about the evolution from, from the shirt to the bag. And I've heard you say before that you, you think that people should find a really good product market fit for one product and then launch slowly into other products. And so I'm wondering you know, now you're known for, for everything. I'm wearing my recommend golf sweater right now. Um, how did you decide to launch a full clothing line? So that decision came from the fact that we had closed down the clothing line. Uh, we were just focusing on the bag. Again, we were like, let's go with this momentum. And a, this is going to really date me guys. But um, if any of you guys remember the Hills, pre the Hills, there was a show called Laguna Beach. They had actually filmed one of my last fashion shows and the cast was there right before they hit it big. And for whatever reason, in 2009, MTV re-aired it and we got all this inbound from stores that said, you launched clothing? Why didn't you tell us? Where can we buy it? And we were like, uh, we don't have it. But it just, we had enough inbound interest from it that we said, let's actually do this. Let's actually revive the clothing. I'm, I'm trained in it. So Let's do this. So that's when we decided to really go for it um, and relaunch the apparel as you know the the complement to the accessories. I also think we looked at the market, and at the time you started to see that if you started out as a ready to wear designer and then expanded into other categories, that was okay. But if you were a handbag designer, a lot of them were getting pigeonholed of like, oh, they're just a handbag designer. They're not a lifestyle brand. And so as we were looking to sort of grow the company get considered as part of the incredible brands that were existing, like a Marc Jacobs or a Kate Spade or a Michael Kors, we said, okay, we have to push, even if we're not totally ready, uh, into these other categories to ensure that we're not just thought of as, oh, they're just a handbag company. Hmm, that's really interesting. I'm also wondering about something you said a little bit earlier about taking on this kind of middle range um, pricing. And I'm wondering why, why that was important to you to go for that contemporary pricing label and not so cheap or so luxury. So I think at the time I wanted to have a bag, not that, not that if I was working, I could have even afforded a 595 bag. Let's be clear. That would have been still too expensive, but I wanted a bag that was theoretically a woman could pay her rent and eat dinner 
and buy the bag. And when you were surrounded by these luxury bags, they were beautiful. But in three months, you were like, oh, I feel bad for her. She just spent $4,000 in that bag and now everyone has it. And it's like, no one wants it anymore. It's no longer cool. So I wanted a bag that you could feel comfortable. Okay, I'm going to buy this bag two, four times a year to update my wardrobe. And it's not going to be that thing that you stare at full of regret. I mean, now we have the real real, so you can sell that regret. Uh, but back then it was like, what do you do with these things, things that look so dated? Um, and so, you know, what really happened shortly after we launched about four years in was the recession. And we had dinner with Saks one night and they said, we love our business with you. Yay. Let's cheers to it. But if there's a five in front of one of your bags, Next year, we won't carry the line. And don't take anything out of the bag. Keep it exactly as is, but make it $2.95, make it $3.95. Um, it's when I got my first gray hair because we had to re-engineer our entire supply chain. We had to figure out how we didn't change anything about the bag, uh, still gave her the quality she wanted, but lower the pricing even more. And that, that was a seismic shift, not only in our business for good, but the customer had just lost her 401k or lost her home or lost her job. And so this was an answer to that. And so because we did that as uh, gray hair making and as nail biting as that experience was, we actually grew during the recession 548%. So it definitely was a strategy that was scary and risky, but it paid off. Wow. That's a really remarkable strategy and definitely or remarkable story and surprising strategy and outcome. Um, yes. <laughs> I think that we have a lot of people in our audience who are hoping to start their own ventures one day, whether that be in clothing or otherwise. And I'm wondering how you decide on your mix of DTC, which has been you know really talked about in the news versus wholesale. Yes, so I'll tell you some regrets, then what we did and now where we are. So in 2013, we had, we had just taken on our first investment in 2012 from a private equity firm. And in 2013, we met another, um, actually a VC that said, I want to diversify your portfolio. I'm going to invest and I want 30% to be wholesale, 30% to be direct to consumer and 30% to be uh, brick and mortar. We love that idea. He was also a very generous man. He said, I want, I want some, you guys to take some of this money off the table so that you can just focus and not worry about living and paying your bills. Our PE firm at the time said, oh, if he wants to pay this much for this company, we're saying no, because we know it's going to be a lot more valuable. So they, they blocked that transaction from happening and we had no control over that. So then what happened was it was all about top line, grow the business at all costs. We grew it. We had about at that point, I would say 80% wholesale, 20% direct to consumer and the entire organization, all of our focus every day is what did Nordstrom say? What did Zach say? What did Bloomingdale say? What did they like? What did they want? Um, and as these stores got more competitive, the line became about what's exclusive to Bloomingdale's, what's exclusive to Saks. And so if you can imagine you're trying to build a brand and stand for something, but you're getting so fragmented with all these different needs and wants, it's really hard to focus. So pre-pandemic, we had a five-year plan to sort of rewrite the ship, make it more like a 50-50 scenario. And the pandemic overnight forced us to do that 100%. So March 16th, we closed our office. March 22nd, the cancellations began. And it was every single retailer. We're ready to ship the goods. Sorry, can't take on your inventory. Don't know when we're going to order. And so we had to say, okay, our only source of income is our website. And everything we do every day, we're going to live and die by it. And we're, that's how we're going to pay our bills. So that was probably the hardest time as an entrepreneur the uh, most unsettling because we had to take pay cuts, do furloughs, do layoffs to figure out what was the magic number every day we had to hit. And then how do you hit that? Suddenly, you know, like, how do we, how do you get more eyeballs? How do you get more traffic? So that forced us to be in that position. Um, and so as awful as this has been for so many people, that was the best thing that could have happened to us as a company, because now what we wanted to do over five years, we did in six months. And now we're never gonna get into a scenario where so many other people are calling the shots, where we'll say, if you want the goods, great, you own them. You know, There's a lot of wheeling and dealing and it sounds fantastic to be in wholesale, but you pay for a lot of that. And so I think 
we're in a position now of strength where we're not relying on them for, for our business. Hmm. That's really interesting to hear. I can't imagine how difficult it must have been around this time last year to go through all of that, but it sounds like it's really accelerated your business in a positive way. Do you think that, yes, for sure. like, do you think you'll go back to brick and mortar? So we definitely are. We're taking orders from wholesale and they are coming back and I'm happy to see that they are. And we have an incredible specialty store business. It's just from a different dynamic of power. I think before we were, you know, that was how we paid the bills. That was how we saw growth. And so we would do anything for them. And now I think it's just a different point of view of, is it profitable? Which is one thing I cannot stress enough. Is that move profitable? Yes. Great. You get a $40 million order. But if it costs you $39,999, is it worth it? So we're trying to look through that lens of, you know, what is the ROI on this? And if it's not making us money, could we go focus our time on a direct to consumer business that's making us, you know, 60, 70% profit? Mm, that's really interesting. It seems like a lot of independent designers like yourself have had to figure out this new balance um, and being able to take control definitely helps with that. Um, and thinking about your stories, I, I remember when you were kind of in the news everywhere because you put um, tech enabled mirrors in your stores. And something I've always admired about you is your willingness in an industry known for being a little bit traditional and not so innovative. You've really embraced lots of new opportunities. And in this pandemic, you definitely have as well from joining the Chinese e-commerce platform Shop Shops to doing OnlyFans during New York Fashion Week. Um, I'm wondering, why you've embraced all of these different technologies and platforms and, and what that, what that's about for your business. So early on, again, I'll date myself before social media, we, you know, there were really two ways I, I saw within the fashion industry to succeed, you know, Anna Winter had to love you or Barney's had to pick you up. And we were really brought up via our consumer. I stumbled across this blog called the purse forum. They were talking about the bags I was in a couple of specialty stores at the time and the passion these women had, I was like, well, let me make a login and let me talk to them. And it was really weird. They did. They thought I was a fake uh, store said I shouldn't talk to my customers, literally heads of the luxury stores that you all shop in said, if you talk to your customer, we will no longer carry you. This was in 2006. Uh, but I was like, but this is great. I get to know what they're thinking, feeling. We were doing crowdsourcing like, oh, you want that purple leather from a year ago? 25 of you, give me your credit cards. I'll run the cards and, and I'll make it. And that's literally how it was done. Um, and, and so I think that we saw the power of that. And so when the walls just kept coming down, it was like, great, another way to communicate, another way to get her data, another another way to become closer to her. So you saw, you know, Facebook, then Twitter, then Instagram. And so it wasn't a strategy that as a big corporation we had to back into. That's how we got here. Mm. And so for us, it's always been important to see what new technology is happening and try it. You know, when Snapchat first launched, it was us and Taco Bell. No one else was on Snapchat. And it was a very lonely space. And we tried it and we're like, okay, we'll come back when more people, more guests have, you know, come to the party. We tried Vine. Um, we tried trending hashtags being broadcast at our fashion shows. We tried drones. Like we're just trying to see where does this stick with the customer. And so for us, with the stores that we had, which are currently closed, um, it was about, you know, there's incredible pain points that don't occur in an e-commerce scenario. Uh, and I'm sure all of you uh, watching right now have that feeling of going into a brick and mortar, being in the dressing room and just wanting to find an associate, but you're half naked. So you pull up your pants halfway, you stick your body out. Um, could we eliminate that? Could we add lighting to the room so that you could see what you're gonna look like for that occasion? Um, could we help you check out seamlessly, you know, within the dressing room? Just little things that, again, e-commerce has sort of handled. And so that was the goal was, how do we take all these annoying things that women experience and, and take as much of that away as possible in order to improve her shopping experience? Um, and it had side effects. You know, we found that we could see if there was a fit issue because we would pull all the things that went in the dressing room and came out that no one bought. Oh, 40 of the same leather jackets went into this dressing room and came out. Let's pull one. Oh, there's a fit issue. Great. So it allowed us also with the data we got to really be nimble as retailers. Hmm, that's really interesting to hear how much you pursued this really hands-on connection with your customer. 
Um, one thing I think people might be surprised to realize about you is just how involved you still are in your business. You're not one of these designers who puts your name up and lets other people take it over. I'm wondering, no, not at all. I'm wondering what parts of the business um, you still really focus on day to day and which parts you've had to hire out for. Okay. Well, there's pre-pandemic and post. <laughs> so um, I had my third baby in uh, February of 2018. And at that moment in my life, um, with the amount of travel I was doing for work and mom of three kids, wanting to be a present focused mom, I could no longer manage 18 direct reports. So we made a really important decision that we would hire someone on the creative team to do the day to day. So I didn't pick the Pantone color of this brown. I didn't pick the button, but I still got to do what I do best. The, you know, the mood boards, the inspiration, all the things that I could say here, this is everything I'm thinking. And then have meetings with one person, not 18, to make sure that all the categories sort of tied back to that original genesis. So that freed me up a lot. It allowed me to launch my podcast. It allowed me to co-found the Female Founder Collective because I also felt like I've been doing this for 15 years and I want to expand my platform to help support more women. So that was really important. Um, then the pandemic hit. Um, and so I became chief copywriter, chief top of funnel marketer, uh, essentially a CMO, even though, um, you know, a lot of the times I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, uh, all the content for the first half, I would say, all of our email, phot photography, all of our social was all me. Then when things started to open up a little bit in September, we were able to get some additional support, but I still oversee the social. Um, I still do all the copywriting and uh, obviously oversee my design team. And then for our big sort of hero events, our two fashion shows, I'm in charge of that from everything from concept, execution, production, raising the money for it, making sure the deals pan out. Um, and so, yeah, so that's kind of how the chips are assorted right now. <laughs> that sounds like a lot. Um, uh, I, won't, I won't ask you how you juggle it all or how you do it all. Cause I think that's such a terrible question for women, but I'm wondering if you, you know, how you structure your days to fit all of this in. So a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> I think that without having a commute, right. Cause most of our office teams are remote right now. Um, I save a lot of time. And so I, I've tried to, I'm not perfect at it, batch what I'm doing. So on the go forward, when I'm going to do a bunch of interviews, I do four interviews in a row and then I'm done for a month. You know, I have a day dedicated to content. Um, I have, you know, my design reviews, whether I do it zoom or I, I happen to be in the city and I'll go in for those design reviews. So I try and batch my time. Um, and then I try and lately not working so well but I'm trying it to like really just focus on work and then at the end of the day when my kids go to sleep when you might be indulging in Netflix and I wish I could I'm doing all my emails and kind of preparing for the next day so I'm, I'm playing right now with how I want it to go because I said to my assistant I'm, I'm drowning hands up I can't do this and I need you to help me fix it so I'm trying to figure out what that new fix looks like yeah I think that's a really really honest answer um I know just in the things that I've led that it can be hard to hand over control to other people. But the flip side of that is it can be overwhelming when you have to manage everything on your own. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in what you were alluding to before about all of these different roles that you have across all of your different ventures. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about um, how the Female Founder Collective evolved out of your business, why you decided to launch your podcast and how all these things fit together. Yes, good question. So the, the, the podcast came first. I felt like the fashion industry, even though it wasn't as Devil Wears Prada-y as it had been when I started, still felt insular. And I just wanted to know other women who were founders. I wanted to know other women doing incredible things. And I then wanted my customer to, to get some sort of, of inspiration of, look at all these incredible leaders. Look at what they're doing. And so I started doing a series of chats at our store in New York. And when I was out in LA, I would host them just interview style. And when I saw that we kept tapping out like the fire marshals code of 94 people or whatever the number is, I was like, there's got to be a more efficient way. And it's not a good user experience if you have like a Facebook live camera aimed at and like people can't see it. So 
I said, let me experiment with this in podcast form. And I also found that women became far more vulnerable um, and I could just reach anybody. It didn't have to be live. Um, so launched that in September of 2018. And just as much as it's been a boost for women, it's been a boost for me because I think you can, you can start to feel like you're alone and that no one else is going through what you're going through. And so when I talk to these women and I'm getting them to share their stories, I think it gives other women who want to launch a business or who are encountering failure or imposter syndrome, like, okay, she, that happened to her. Oh, okay, good. I'm good then. Like, this is normal. Um, and then with Female Founder Collective, um, as I was getting more notoriety and speaking on more panels, I just noticed like we're an echo chamber. We're all complaining about the wage gap. Is anyone making more money because of it? No. Um, and I, and I hated this, like, what's it like to be a female founder as if we're a polar bear, like we're a rare species, right? So I said, okay, there's gotta be a way that the power of women coming together that are all founders can help each other, whether it's our black books of resources, whether it's the best tech resource, whether it's, uh, I don't know how to fundraise, but I need to, let me get the best woman who's raised a lot of money and has been through that to teach her how. Um, I also found that women start their businesses with a passion, AKA me, and not always the know-how to, how do you, how do you make this into a business? How do you make money? And so that was the impetus for launching the Female Founder Collective. And we've galvanized over 9,000 businesses. Uh, we have a really important seal that's on about 3 million products that hopefully any consumer can say, oh, I want to support a woman today. Oh, I'm going to look at the back of my package. Great. Now I know I've supported a woman-owned business. So I have big goals for the seal. Um, obviously, you know, you probably all remember that moment when you said non-GMO project verified. Oh yeah, that means I can eat it and it doesn't have uh, GMOs, you know? So if we could get the seal to a level of like, oh, woman, yes. 51% of my products are going to be women owned. You know, what that would do for wealth inequality, what that would do for the wage gap could be incredibly powerful. So that's my other mission. And I have an incredible co-founder and CEO. So she runs the day-to-day. -day. Uh, we have an event at the end of March. If you're curious, you can head over to our Instagram. Uh, it's a two-day virtual event with you're going to be learning. It's not rah, rah, you're inspiring. Hear my success. It's like, oh, you don't know this. This is what you're going to learn. So I encourage you all to get a ticket. Mm, that's so amazing. I think one reason we really wanted to have you today for the women entrepreneurs was because you're not just an amazing women entrepreneur yourself, but you've really lifted up a lot of other women. And I absolutely love your podcast to all our attendees. I can't recommend it enough. I think you're having Yay. some of the most honest conversations about women in business. Um, Thank so you. <laughs> moving in a little bit of a different direction. Um, I think that Rebecca McGough, the brand, has a really clear brand voice and it comes through really authentically. I know that's kind of an overused word, but I'm wondering if you have, have you thought about your brand voice or your brand strategy at all and what that might look like? Well, I'm happy to hear you say that because um, I just had a conversation today about it wasn't good enough, but um, here's, here's where we're at. So the pandemic happened and I'll never forget, I feel like Forbes wrote this article, like Rebecca Minkoff's strategy, keeping it real, taking Zoom meetings on her bathroom floor. And I was like, this isn't a strategy, you guys. That is the only place I could go in a house that was not meant to be fully lived in full time, where there was two sets of double doors. You couldn't hear my kids kicking down, you know, kicking and screaming. Um, and so I knew that like what my customer is going through is the same thing. And so why fake it? Why, why not just embrace the chaos and, and whatever? And so I was very honest about that from, you know, from the beginning. And obviously when we saw that, you know, she liked our top of funnel video of me doing dumb things in the backyard versus some glossy shoot, we said, great, you know, if that gets more engagement and that makes her happy, like I'm happy to do that. I think what we're trying to do, and I'm, the conversation I'm referring to this morning is, um, we still need to keep a certain level of elevation for the brand. And sometimes maybe, um, you know, some of the being too authentic, you, what you don't want to do is say, this girl's going to go spend $300 on a bag. And that needs to, that's her luxury, right? For our customer. That is her, that is her price point that she's saving her money for. And so you don't want to get too silly where she doesn't then respect you. Um, so how do we sort of elevate it, but still keep it really honest. So we're sorting through that now. We're having lots of brand meetings and talks about that. 
That's really interesting. Um, I'm going to ask you a few more questions, but I also just want to invite all of our attendees, if you have questions for Becca, which I'm sure you do, to put them in the Q&A function. If that's not working for you for some reason, you can also throw them in the chat. Um, I have, have, haven't listened to almost every episode of your podcast because I am that, that yeah. obsessed. I'm really curious to ask you the questions you always ask your interviewees, which are, um, what's one piece of advice that you've been given or you've given? <laughs> and maybe what's something that we would be surprised to learn about you? Okay. <clears throat> I've shared, um, I've shared one of the things of being surprised to know about me. Um, but I have this unnatural fear of like sharks and lakes, um, killers in the woods. There are zombies everywhere. If you're in the wooded space, I'll never go camping much to my husband's dismay. So I know that those are irrational things for the most part. Um, yet I still have those fears. And so I will not go into the depths, you know, past here of any body of water. Um, as far as advice, uh, I think the best advice or one piece that I loved, and this was, I believe from either Sally Krawcheck who owns Elevest or Patty Sellers who launched, um, for Forbes most powerful women conference. And they said, if women talked about money, as much as they talk about sex, how much further alone would we be as far as equal pay? And so I notice it. If I go to anything where it's women, we're showing each other pictures of our kids. You know, we're talking about, you know, did we have enough sex tonight or the, that month? No one's like, what did you invest in? Did you get Bitcoin? What did you think of this? Like, and so if we could change that dynamic between us to ask those uncomfortable questions, what do you make? Did you ask for a raise? How much did you ask for? I think that overall, if we could get through that discomfort, wherever that comes from, we'd be a lot better off. Yeah, that's great. That's a, that's a really good fun fact about you and a, a really good piece of advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm wondering if I can ask my co-hosts if we're getting any questions in or if there's anything that you would like to ask. And I will let you turn on your mic if you'd like to, or I will keep going with my question. Am I freezing up for you guys? No, no. no I think you're totally fine. Okay, okay, um, okay, good. No questions in the Q&A yet. Okay. I, I know you don't be shy. Listen in. Um, I know that this has been obviously a, a crazy year. That's an understatement at this point. Everyone's talked about that. But I'm wondering if you can tell us, you've, you've talked a little bit about how your business has changed, but maybe um, any lessons that you have, you know, that you're going to take in your business going forward or any ways that you've navigated yeah. this super challenging time as an independent designer. Yeah, a couple of things. I think that there is the there in the zeitgeist right now there is this desire to i have an idea i need to raise a bunch of money and that's all i hear about right from young women starting businesses and my first question to you is why i was just listening to a woman on clubhouse fundraising she's like well i need to hire a customer service person i need to hire a logistics person like i have to hire all these people and I was like, you know what you need to do? You need to design a bag that isn't ugly. Let's start there, right? Because you're going to hire the customer service person and no one wants your product. Um, that sounds harsh, but um, I'm being honest. So I think that there's all this have to have before we do. And, and one of the things as uncomfortable as it was is we bootstrapped for seven years. So we, had to get, we were forced to get our hands dirty. We were forced to make something out of nothing. And so when you encounter a pandemic like this, if you've already been through that, I have to rebuild, I have to start from zero and get to where I was. As, as much as you might not want to do it, you know exactly how to do it. You know exactly how to be down and dirty and scrappy again. And I would hate for someone to go in, raise a bunch of money, sell off most of their company, not retain control. And then when stuff like this happens, you're not as nimble and you don't, you've never been through it. And so I can't say it enough that it might seem sexy to go raise a bunch of money, but it just means that you now don't work for yourself unless you retain control. Um, and the best thing we did was we waited seven long, dry years. Uh, we took in a little bit of money, but my brother was like, we are maintaining control. So we will not take in more than that. And thank God we didn't because if they had control, they would have shut down clothing. They would have shut down stores. They would have shut down shoes and jewelry and sunglasses. Why? Because on the spreadsheet, it didn't make, make that much sense. Sorry, these numbers don't add up. 
And, you know, now look at us, we're a lifestyle brand. We have all these incredible categories. Um, and so just be careful about what might seem sexy and make sure that you have product market fit, you have heat and desire, and then you can sell from, from a point of strength. Um, and just to add to it, I know I sound long winded, but I think that <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with having a profitable, small and steadily growing company. Not everyone has to go from zero to a billion dollars to be successful. Like if you look at America, it was built on small businesses. They paid for your lifestyle and they, they had a good product. And so I hope more entrepreneurs start thinking that way versus like, I need to be the next unicorn. I think that's such important advice. And you're totally right that there's this ethos of go big, have a high burn rate, raise a billion dollars, but going slow and steady for 20 years is, is probably more impressive. Um, so we have some questions coming in from the chat and I'll also ask why, why did you finally raise money? What were your goals for that? So at that time we did want to expand into more categories and we did want to open stores. And so we knew with the real estate prices, um, that the, the, revenues we were bringing in would never cover $70,000 a month in rent in Soho. So we thought that we would raise a little bit of money. It wasn't a big number to do that. Um, and so that's, that's how we deployed the funds was to launch our Soho, San Francisco and LA stores. Definitely. I'm in San Francisco now and I visited that store. It was very lovely. Um, I know it was, it was a mistake in location. So we closed it, but it was cute. Well, I hope you'll come back. <laughs> um, we have a question on this subject. Somebody asks, um, do you have any regrets getting funding from a private equity firm and dealing with how much control they had over decisions? And are there other routes to go? Yeah, there's a ton of routes. So the only regret I had is, again, when I speak to that other VC that was interested in, in <clears throat> positioning our business differently, had I been well-versed in business the way that I am now, I would have been like the craziest woman you've ever seen to get that PE firm out and get this VC firm in because they had the right idea. They had this idea before direct to consumer was even a thing. So if we could have been part of that first push, probably an entirely different book would have been written. Um, but I didn't know enough about business. So I always encourage designers like, great, you can design, learn all the other stuff that you want to cringe, you know, logistics, business, um, what does the word EBITDA mean? Like all these things that it took me so long, like seven, 10 years before I even cared. I wish I would have known it then. Cause I think the outcomes could have been different. Um, and I think there's great other forms of capital that you can raise. You can crowdfund. I fund women is an incredible platform to crowdfund on, uh, that supports specifically women owned businesses. You can get angels, you can get friends and family. Like I think when people, again, think they have to have all this money to launch their product. Yes, if you're launching a tech product and you need engineers, but as product makers, you don't need as much money as you think you need. You know, we, if, if I look back before, before we took in our first raise, you know, there was a credit card and some people don't like talking about this that my brother used, or there was a credit line we got from a bank or we used a company called a factor, which is um, a lender specifically in the fashion industry. They lend based off of POs. So it's a little more expensive in the beginning, but once you get going, uh, that money is actually far cheaper than diluting your entire company. So we still have this factor and they're at, at, at any given moment, you know, they're loaning us 12 million bucks. Um, and yes, they're taking a percentage, but that's $12 million I didn't need to sell off in my company. And when we have our big exit, you know, they'll get that money back or we'll pay them down as we do each year. So I think there's, you can be creative, especially if it's not, um, again, you're building some tech product that has to scale very quickly to, to take market share. Mm, I think that's a really helpful tactical answer for a lot of the future founders in our audience. And we have one of those founders who's asking, um, she says, I'm in the process of starting a new brand, self-funded, and hiring committed people for skills that I don't have has been extremely difficult. Any advice on hiring the right people? So I think it depends what the skill set is. I think there are a lot of roles that you can train for, and yes, it might take time to train for them, but I think that, again, if it's not like you need someone, an engineer, and the person's like, I don't know how to code, obviously find that, but I think that... Um, 
so many roles can be trained and it just takes the right person who is hardworking and persevering. You know, my, the woman that oversees a community now at Female Founder Collective started as a, a receptionist at Rebecca Minkoff. And she worked her way up all the way through PR manager to then over to my executive assistant. She helped me launch FFC and we moved her there full time. So she didn't have any background in anything she did, not in PR, not in running a community, not in launching a company. And she was just like that, I'll attack it and get it done. So I look for those people. I think those are the most valuable people because uh, if they have that mentality, they'll figure it out. That's super helpful. We have another question, and I think that your new book will also talk a lot about this. Somebody asks, how did you think about and evaluate risk in your career path? What is your advice for young students about graduating and how they should find a level of risk they are comfortable with? So I believe in taking big risks that, um, you know, I moved to New York City with nowhere to live and two suitcases. Uh, I launched uh, a company off the backs of, you know, Jen Elfman wearing my shirt on TV. I lied to her when she said, do you do bags? And I said, yes, I do bags. So for me, I've always said, okay, this is really scary, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, and so obviously there are certain risks which could be detrimental. Like I'm going to go a hundred thousand dollars in debt for a company that I haven't started yet for a product that no one cares about. But I think if you're able and you're smart and you're going to Yale, so you've got to be smart. Um, I think that if you can sort of do the assessment, what, are, what is the upside here? What is the risk? And, you know, is, is the worst thing that can happen I fail? Good. We all need to fail because it teaches us valuable lessons. Every time I fail, I'm like, yep, just learn something. And if you don't have that, it's dangerous because then you won't know what to do if something catastrophic happens. So I think if you say, okay, from this risk, I'm not going to be, you know, homeless from it. Um, I'm not going to die from it. You know, you're young. You have so much time ahead of you. Take the risk because you'll always learn something that'll make you better. And whether it's working in a company or starting something new. Hmm, that's really great advice. Um, we have kind of a similar question. Somebody asks, do you have any suggestions for overcoming the fear of new business feasibility in the current time where new ideas and new companies makes it less possible to capture your consumer base? So I think right now, you know, there, there's going to be from now on probably the boom of more solo entrepreneurs than there ever has been. If you just take the numbers of the people that are unemployed, the people that have left the workforce on their own accord, all those people feel like something's broken in corporate America and they want to fix it. So that's only going to continue. And so I think your skill at marketing and, and showing how your white shirt, which is the same as Hanes, is better and different than anyone else's is going to be, uh, that's the skill you need to acquire is how do you market differently? How do you talk differently? I just listened to this. Um, Shopify has a series of YouTube sort of podcast slash YouTube episodes the founder of Gymshark. I'd never heard of Gymshark, but I was like, this guy has, is worth a billion dollars. Who's this dude? He doesn't, his product isn't necessarily that much better, but he thinks differently in how he markets to his consumer, which sets him apart. So I think, you know, you don't need a lot of money to think differently. Our differentiator in the pandemic is we were just down to earth. We were just real, you know, another designer was baking um, pumpkin bread in his billion dollar apartment and no one could relate to that you know, but they could relate to the mom who has three kids, who's homeschooling, who's also trying to run a business. And so I think that um, you can find your differentiator point and make sure that you're as creative as possible. And again, does not take money to be creative. It's all in here. I think that's really helpful advice. Um, Serena asks, she says, thanks so much for coming to speak to us. And she wants to ask, what inspires you to keep moving forward, especially during times when your business wasn't making a profit or times you felt discouraged? I think as a, as a, as a human, you're going to go through the different things that become value propositions that enable you to keep going. So in the beginning, I had nothing to lose. So keeping going just was the only way I could only move forward because there was really nothing for me if I stopped. Um, you know, I, it's very real for me that I used to call my, my bank account because, again, smartphones hadn't been invented yet um, to see if I had enough money to go out and eat. 
So then when I could eat out and not check my bank account, I was like, this is, this is working. I like this lifestyle, right? I can order a drink at dinner instead of, you know, water. Um, and then, and then when you start to see all of your hard work and success pay off, when I ran up to my, the first time I saw a woman in with my bag, I was like, that's my bag. And she like grabbed her bag. She's like, that's my bag. I was like, I know it's your bag. I know, I know, but I designed that. And I saw that on you. So that reward, that smile that I get, or that like internal, like, oh my God, she has my bag that never goes away. Um, then you grow a company and then you have staff who you love. And you're like, I got to keep going on these hard days because I'm responsible for all these people's livelihoods and their families. Um, and then it, it escalates. Now I have my responsibilities with my family. And so there's a lot of points at which if one thing is not inspiring to you, you're like, oh, those 25 people that work their asses off for me, I'm going to show up for them. Um, or, oh, New York City is the most expensive city in the world. I got to be able to eat. Um, or then you see another woman wearing your bag, or you get asked to speak at events like this, or, you know, you get an agent saying, Harper Collins wants you to write a book. You're just like, okay, it's worth it. Like that fuel, um, from all those different areas can help. And so I think it's important. It's not just about the money, because I think that if you're chasing that, you're chasing the wrong dream. It's not about fame. Um, it's about, do you love what you do so much that nothing else matters that you can't think about anything else? Because fame is fleeting and money could never happen. I think that is absolutely the perfect answer to end this on. Um, Rebecca, it was such a pleasure for me personally to meet you. Thank you so much for your advice, your candor, your stories. We really appreciate it. Of course. And if I could just plug real quick, my book, my book comes out June 15th. It's aptly titled, uh, aptly titled fearless. And, um, it's me telling you my life story, but all the rules I had to sort of get rid of in order to be successful. I've shared some of them with you today, but if you're a founder and entrepreneur, you don't even have to be interested in fashion. These 21 chapters take you through new ways to think, new ways to sort of chart your own path. So pre-order it because as an author, which I'm finding out, it's a very humbling experience. You have to sell a lot of books before they even come out. So if you can pre-order it now, it, it helps with the algorithm. So I appreciate it and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. I've pre-ordered mine. I can't wait to read it. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Thank you all, all of our attendees. Bye. I really appreciate it. Bye. Thank you.